church and had some sort of the conversations. We're now going to move into um, our Anthony Shadid Award for Journalism Ethics. So I would like to introduce the chair of the committee that uh, selects the Shadid Award, which has a very, very, very tough challenge in so doing. And that would be my colleague, Professor Lucas Grace. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so I'll say just a few words about the Shadid Award and about our five finalists this year. Uh, and then we'll play a video that lets you hear from the finalists in their own words, describing some of the sort of ethical challenges that they face. Uh, and that also talks a bit about Anthony Shadid and about the kind of journalism that he practiced and about his legacy. Uh, this is the video that we'll play two weeks from now at the award ceremony in New York when the Shadid uh, Award is officially uh, handed out. Many of you know, I think, who uh, who's receiving the honor this year, but I'll keep you in suspense if you don't. Uh, and so I'll just say, before playing the video, uh, that we had a really incredible group of finalists this year. I've been doing this uh, for three years. This is my third year as a, as a Shadid Award judge. Some of my fellow judges have been doing it even longer. Uh, and we always say that the choice gets more difficult every year because the pool of submissions just gets stronger and stronger. Uh, and our five finalists in this case were really all such incredible pieces of journalism uh, that it took a lot of conversation and a lot of discussion to sort of uh, narrow it down to, uh, uh, to one winner. These five finalists, as you'll see in the video, uh, are all very different. Uh, the stories have different topics. They focus on different parts of the country, different parts of the world. Uh, one important thing that they have in common, which is really tied to the mission of the Shadida work, uh, is that they all focus on journalism's core mission of giving voice to the voiceless. Uh, these are all stories that, uh, that, that talk about uh, people who've been abused in some way uh, by, by others who have power over them, by those who have power over them. Uh, I'll give you a few examples of that. Uh, so we have one story that's about uh, migrant children uh, in U.S. detention centers separated from, uh, from their families after crossing the border. Uh, we have students at Chicago public schools uh, who were abused uh, by the staff and by the faculty uh, who were supposed to be taking care of them. Uh, they're uh, prisoners of war in Yemen, uh, tortured by their captors. Uh, ProPublica submitted uh, its reporting on the story of uh, an informant, a gang informant who'd been a member of the MS-13 gang uh, in Long Island, uh, and who was betrayed by the prosecutors who had promised to protect him after he helped them to, uh, to take down the gang. Uh, and then we have the story of the scores, uh, even hundreds of young women, uh, most of them underage, who were abused by the uh, hedge fund titan Jeffrey Epstein, and then betrayed by the prosecutors who struck a secret deal uh, with Epstein uh, that essentially let him off, let him off stop free. Uh, the tragic dilemma, the tragic ethical dilemma that always accompanies this kind of reporting uh, is that telling these stories ironically tends to put people who've already been victimized uh, at even greater risk and to expose them to the potential uh, for new kinds of injustice. Uh, and the whole point of the Shadid Award uh, is to recognize the careful ethical decision making uh, that reporters uh, 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 make in sort of tackling these choices with thoughtfulness and conscientiousness uh, in trying to balance the needs of the story uh, against the needs of the people that they're reporting on, who, after all, have to live in the world uh, after the story comes out. As we'll see, there's no simple formula for making those kinds of choices. Sometimes the right answer is to hold back uh, a bit of information that you really want to include, because it brings the story to life in an amazing way. Uh, but in other cases, the answer is uh, to let your sources take on sometimes a you know a very grave risk, uh, but but making sure that they understand uh, the risks that they're facing and the choices that uh, that they're making. All of our finalists show an exquisite conscientiousness and in some cases ingenuity in <coughs> making these choices. Uh, one of them we agreed uh, was an even better example of this kind of decision making. Uh, than the rest, but I'll, uh, I'll let you watch the video. 
and then we'll uh, uh, we'll sort of uh, be the winner. So go ahead and. Uh, When I hear the uh, name Anthony Shadid, I think about his incredible reporting from the Middle East. Um, you know, he was a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, both times uh, was for his reporting from Iraq. And I think of heroism uh, and the real service to the craft of journalism that then he gave his life for. I think this is one of the few um, journalistic awards that focuses purely on ethics and the way that reporters have to deal on a daily basis. The in-depth reporting, the quality of writing, the meticulous attention devoted to ethics was very impressive and I think what sets the Shadid Award apart from others. These reporters are committed uh, to that kind of process but I think you would like the idea of celebrating reporting, giving voice to the ordinary person uh, and telling their story in um, ways that are compelling and interesting to readers and maybe even uh, motivating people to do something about the problems that he's reporting on. We carefully weighed the impact of the various entries and most importantly, the ethical dilemma facing the journalist journalists who work very hard to protect their sources and make sure that they did as little harm as possible to those they were reporting on. I think Anthony Shadid would be very impressed, even elated, with this year's entries and finalists. I know I was. So when we learned that the federal government was separating parents and children as policy, we began investigating where those children were being taken and the conditions that they were being held in. We identified tender age shelters where they were detaining babies and toddlers. The day after we reported this, President Trump ended officially the family separation policy. We found out that parents who had been separated from their kids faced a risk of losing those children to adoption if the parents were deported. And we learned that decades after the United States stopped putting kids in orphanages because they knew it caused lifelong trauma, that as a policy, the U.S. government was doing it again. We felt it was incredibly important ethically to tell them who we were as journalists and why we were asking questions. They had so many adults coming in and out of their lives. We wanted them to know who we were. And then also in interviewing them, we felt it was really important to let them guide the conversation. In March 2018, we received several messages from inside one of the prisons in southern Yemen, which is under the control of the United Arab Emirates. We started to look into these allegations and to speak to detainees and try as much as possible to document how they use sexual abuse in recruiting detainees and also in forcing them to give confessions about terrorism. One of the main challenges we faced is how to protect the men while speaking against the Emirati officials who are controlling their own prison. They are still inside and uh, they could face a risk of more abuse. The prisoners, however, insisted that we publish the name and the location and all details possible. Authorities uh, have released uh, dozens of detainees. The legitimate government uh, in Yemen spoke against torture in a rare uh, statement uh, about uh, secret prisons, and the interior minister demanded the Emiratis to either shut down these prisons or put them under his own control. There was a hidden pattern of sexual violence in Chicago public schools. The number of, of cases were simply staggering. Uh, the cases had been hidden. And we, when we started to dig out uh, case by case what was going on, we found that there were patterns of harm again and again where child protective uh, measures had utterly failed or been disregarded. We understood early on that there were going to be ethical challenges in dealing with survivors of sexual abuse and assault. Uh, we had regular conversations to make sure we were on the same page in how to, uh, how to approach those victims and those survivors, how to speak with them, and, and who to speak with, frankly. Um, we decided early on that we were not going to be in the business of convincing these young people 
uh, to talk to the newspaper. The Chicago Public School System uh, immediately overhauled how it was handling these cases, did background checks on 44,000 employees, and instituted a new office to deal with this. And the changes went all the way up to the federal government where uh, Illinois Senators Durbin and Duckworth asked the U.S. Education Department to step in. And we really feel that those uh, reforms and changes are going to protect young people in our schools for years to come. This was a story about a lot of young girls that had been molested when they were teenagers, about 13 to 16 years old in West Palm Beach. And I decided that what I needed to do was to throw everything out that had ever been written about this case before. Here you had a man who had abused hundreds of girls and had basically gotten away uh, with a slap on the wrist. I had to convince these girls that I was going to tell that story. I wasn't going to focus on the sexual part of it. Although, of course, they had to talk about that in order um, to tell the full story. And I had to be patient. Some of them I had to interview several times. It was very difficult for them to be forthcoming on our first interview. And I didn't press it. I, I let their stories come out as they felt comfortable telling me about them. And in the end, uh, a couple of the girls told me that they felt un finally unburdened, as if finally someone understood exactly what this case was about. So my story was about the ways that immigration detention and the stepped up immigration enforcement under Trump are sometimes interfering with criminal investigations. The story focused on Henry, a 17-year-old MS-13 informant. He went to police for help escaping his gang. He gave the police information that they used to make arrests and law enforcement then turned on him and handed him over to ICE for deportation, and he was jailed alongside the people he informed on. Henry's life was in extreme danger when I met him. He was getting death threats from the gang. They suspected that he was an informant, and we were gonna do a story all about how he did inform to the FBI and to the police, and we were worried that exposing him could get him killed. Journalists have such a responsibility to try to tell stories that will help generate empathy and help people see sides of these really polarizing issues like immigration in a way that they never would otherwise. With the Henry story, we had some readers write in and say that this was the first time they felt compassion for an undocumented immigrant. And that for me was so meaningful because those are the readers who I'm really trying to get through to when I'm writing about immigrants. Our School of Journalism and Mass Communication has long been committed to teaching the ethics of journalism. The Shadid Award gives us an opportunity to celebrate that commitment and to highlight the deep value of a free press in our democracy. I am proud to honor the legacy of Anthony Shadid and to call him a UW alum. And I'm delighted to celebrate this year's winners of the Anthony Shadid Award for Journalism Ethics. On behalf of all of us here at UW-Madison, congratulations and thank you for your dedication to outstanding journalism. So the recipient of the 2019 Anthony Shadid Award for Journalism Ethics, drum roll, this is public information already, uh, but it's fun to, uh, to say it anyway, uh, is the Miami Herald team for the Perversion of Justice series. Uh, so I hope that we can all applaud them, but before we do that, I wanted to also extend a really warm thanks to the members of the uh, judging committee uh, for the really hard work they put into reading all of these stories and discussing them at great length. Uh, as I said, it's not easy to uh, make these decisions, although in this case, we really did reach quite a strong consensus after uh, lots of back and forth, after lots of conversation. So thanks to Joel Geisler, uh, to Chuck Stokes, to Brendan Nardi, to Jenny Price, and to Martin Kaiser, several of you are in the room right now. And I also wanted to extend a special note of thanks uh, to Krista Eastman, uh, who really uh, facilitated the process all the way through. 
uh, uh, it helped out so much. So congratulations to the uh, Miami Herald team and to all the judges. Uh, Center's triple threat, Jill Geisler. Uh, she's an alum of the School of Journalism. She serves on our board, and she's also my really dear friend. So Jill is going to lead us today in our final panel, which is focused on where we go. We've, we've really tangled with troubling things all day. So let's uh, let's look at how to fix this, how to take us forward. So I'm going to invite Jill's panelists up as well, with a little reminder to please get as close to the microphone as possible. <laughs> Thank you. It does make you feel good about journalism to see all of those nominees. And when you look at the stories, they're discouraging about the human condition. Journalism is what makes the difference. And I think we're in the same position, having heard the stories this morning about the problems that remain unresolved. But if, as I like to teach in leadership, the intersection of reality and optimism is hope. And that's what this panel is about. I want to talk to you a little bit about some people who are doing good things, things that you can either learn from, emulate, or even take advantage of yourself. Um, and so this is a hand-selected panel, and we'd like to thank Lindsay for joining us. She is substituting for the person who is in your program uh, from the International Women's Media Foundation, whose doctor said her knee surgery hadn't uh, healed sufficiently well enough to allow her to travel. So um, we, we absolutely want her to be healthy, and Lindsay jumped in. And because Lindsay's research is so aligned with the kind of work that the IWMF is doing on behalf of women internationally and domestically, she's a perfect fit. So thank you. And also with us is Sharif Durms, who is the president of NLGJA. And beside uh, Sharif is Sue Ramsett, who is the general. Now, what I love about this is a journalist who becomes a general manager at a television station. So the decisions are being made every day through the prism of journalism. And so in the Quad Cities, we've got Sue Ramsey. And then um, I like to refer to the last person on the panel as the founding HR director of something called the PowerShift Project, which you'll hear about in a moment. But that's not really her title. She is the VP of HR at Politico. Her name is Tracy Schweigert. She has a journalism degree. So now we've got journalism fueling HR at a major <laughs> journalism outlet. Kind of a cool story. And each of them has something to tell you. I was introduced as uh, a member of the board. Another title of mine is the Bill Plant Chair in Leadership and Media Integrity at Loyola University Chicago. But for purposes of this conversation, um, I am one of the leaders of what's called the Power Shift Project. And never have I felt better suited to be in a room talking about the Me Too movement. Um, because the Power Shift Project is uh, something that was created by the Freedom Forum Institute in 2018 in response to the Me Too scandals in media. We have a very short video that explains it, which will help set the table for a lot of what we're going to talk about. Christy, can we see it? Growing reports of sexual harassment. From Hollywood to Capitol Hill to the media. The most vulnerable. It could be through being a minority, through being a woman. Disturbing allegations from six women. How many of these stories are out there? Be honest with ourselves about what's happening within our organizations. We push other companies and we report on them. We're not great at doing that about ourselves. In late 2017, when Me Too revelations exposed sexual harassment and misconduct in many media organizations, we immediately began looking at what role we could play in creating meaningful and sustainable change within the industry. When we convened the first Power Shift Summit, we didn't know how many people would be willing to participate and have these really difficult conversations. The most memorable moments have been seeing the commitment of media companies who want to solve this problem. You have to have organizational culture change. You have to have leaders who really want to make a change in the workplace. Our goal is workplace integrity, and we define that as workplaces free of harassment and discrimination and full of opportunity. Empowering people who are seeing this stuff happen to tell someone. 
My father was a big champion of diversity and promoting women and people of color. Diversity and inclusion is really in our DNA and in all the programs we do. How many people in this past year have introduced the subjects of harassment discrimination into your conversations in ways you haven't before? We believe that we can improve the quality and future of journalism if we work together and we create safer, more inclusive, and diverse media organizations. That video was produced for the Freedom Forum's Free Spirit Awards, which took place in Washington, D.C. at the museum about three weeks ago. And I had the privilege of presenting one of those awards to Tarana Burke, the founder of the Me Too movement. And I asked her at that time, is there a message that you want me to bring forward to journalists? And it was, keep telling the stories. Just keep telling the stories. In 2018, when we had the first summit, everything was fresh. I mean, the stories were old. The news was fresh. And the people who were in the eye of the storm agreed to come to the museum, 130 strong. They were media leaders, some of whom represented the very uh, organizations that were going through self-examinations at that, at that moment. NPR was there, having, uh, having uh, fired my Horeskis. CBS was there dealing with Charlie Rose. Uh, the New York Times was there dealing with Glenn Thrush. Uh, PBS was there, uh, with, which also had Charlie Rose. Um, but the room was filled with media leaders, with survivors, with the EEOC, with the National Women's Law Center, and we learned a lot. Also in that room that day was Tracy Schweiker. <laughs> I always pick on her because at, at some point, People started saying, you know, the real problem is HR. We don't, you know, you can't trust them. Yeah. <laughs> and knowing that the head of HR for Politico was in the room, and knowing that she had initiated many things already there, I called on her. And I'm going to call on her again to talk a bit about the kind of change you had initiated before Me Too Growth but also what's going on now. Because as people were talking about how do we help interns, how do we protect our reporters, how do we onboard people, how do we make sure that we've got diversity in the newsroom, um, I'm just checking off going, ask Tracy, ask Tracy. <laughs> Tracy, we just start? Yeah, no, um, thank you very much for including me in this conversation. Um, I do think the biggest change um, that I have seen is just the way that we approach uh, employees in general. Uh, early in my career, I've been doing this for 25 years, early in my career, I was taught and often said, listen, being creepy isn't against the law, right? What we did was based on where the law told us to work. Fortunately, when you do that, you miss the opportunity to catch things early. You miss the opportunity to have conversations, to let people know that you're there supporting them. Uh, so some of the things that we've done at Politico and some of the things that I advocate that all organizations do is not just do what's legally required, but really think about the culture that you want an organization to have. What is the culture that your employees deserve? And so that means that, yes, we might do online training because there's some good data there that everybody needs to have, but we follow that up with quarterly conversations to say, listen, what did you hear about that training? What did you like? What did you not like? How does that work in our office environment? Tracy, may I just jump in for a moment? And, and I think that the importance of what you're saying is based on the 2016 EEOC Select Task Force on Sexual Harassment, which is online and available to you, and which almost predicted what was about to happen because it, it was a meta-analysis of research into anti-harassment training and found no evidence up until this point that any of the current anti-harassment training was effective. It was, it helped people mitigate risk of lawsuits, but it did not necessarily change behavior. And so it was, it was imposed without any evidence of, of success. And the reason that you now continue to do it um, is that that's important to do, but you know it's not enough. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's really important is you want to make sure that there's a level of understanding that really can be applied to a day-to-day -day situation, right? I mean, I, many of us have said throughout many power shift conversations, an open bathrobe, we know that's sexual harassment, right? Um, a, a microaggression, a uh, brush of the shoulder, uh, a hey honey, is that, is it not? Maybe I'm being too sensitive, maybe I'm not. Um, and so what we do at Politico is we have those conversations. Every intern class we bring in, I sit down with them specifically and I talk about the culture that we have at Politico, what I expect of every employee at Politico, and where uh, I expect them to look out for each other in terms of being active bystanders and where I am hoping that they will come to me or any member of my team to talk about uh, a situation that might not be right. Uh, I've also made sure that we put our resources behind that too. Once upon a time, I said, well, you know, I just don't know that we don't have enough time to meet with everybody in the organization. Well, what else would we be doing if we didn't? And so every new employee that comes into the organization meets with a member of my team that is commensurate with where they are in the organization because I also know that sometimes a title like the VP of HR um, is a little scary for an entry-level person and so I've got my entry-level folks meeting with entry-level employees. I've got my managers in HR meeting with managers. I'm meeting with the executives and each of us are talking from the places where we sit about the culture we expect and all of the ways that we can be looking out for the culture from where we sit and, and what we have as culture. But if HR is the only one having this conversation, um, it doesn't work. Um, your, the, your executive editor has also made a few things explicit about the culture she expects in the newsroom. Can you quote a few Carrie Buda Brownisms? Yes. So uh, Carrie uh, is a journalist, and her language is a little more colorful than mine, but I think it, it hits it right on the nose. Um, Carrie has a no assholes policy. Um, and what she means by that is no individual in the newsroom, no matter how good they are as a journalist, um, has the opportunity to be an asshole to anyone else. And what's happened is, is that's shorthand for us. If we get into a situation and we're like, well, you know, what's going on here? We, we check ourselves and we say, all right, we have no assholes policy. What are, what are we dealing with here? Um, what action do we need to take? What conversations do we need to have? Um, and that's been really helpful for us. And so yes, having a partner like Carrie has been pivotal to being able to do that because one, she welcomes us into the conversation. Two, she knows that we're there for her and all of her employees. Um, and we regularly talk about it. And we're constantly challenging ourselves to figure out what else can we do. The other problem that we have is that you may have policies and organizations, but you have informal cultural norms that can fly in the face of them. And so you may have, for example, flexible work, or you may have a maternity or a paternity leave policy, but it can appear to be disadvantageous to your career if you take advantage of them. To that end, what does Carrie do? So uh, we, almost two and a half years now, we uh, implemented a gender neutral parental leave policy. Um, we did not put a time frame on it because a new employee is no more or less deserving of parental leave than someone who's been with us for two or three years. Um, and when Carrie is aware, and to be honest with you, when any of our managers are aware, our business side as well, that anyone is expecting a child, they will reach out to that employee and say, and you're going to take all of your leave, right? Um, because we have, we've reported on those stories. Um, we've heard about those organizations that have beautiful policies in the handbook that nobody dares take. And we want to make sure that that's not the case. And so she is actively, specifically in the newsroom, saying, listen, what can we do to support you? What can we do to make sure that all of our mothers and all of our fathers uh, take the time to be with their family? So Back again in January 2018, just as this program is being live streamed, uh, so was the first PowerShift Summit. And it was an emotional day of people revealing for the first time uh, what they had been through, uh, what they were trying to fix, and what approaches they thought would be helpful. Um, and far away at a station called KWQC, uh, somebody was tuned into that live stream. And her name is Sue Ramson. 
What was going on in your world at that moment? I think as a general manager, um, someone who's tasked with leading an organization, everything that was happening nationally was weighing heavy on a lot of us, um, just acknowledging what was happening in the industry, um, how to make sure that wasn't happening in our buildings. And I think, um, you know, I, I saw our Shin Summit on social media actually that morning, and I thought, oh, that, that looks really interesting. I'm, I'm, I want to be part of that solution, so I'm going to just tune in for a little bit. And as I've shared with Jill, I, I couldn't turn it off. I got nothing else done all day long. And I would pause it, and I would go to a meeting, I would come back, and I would start it again. Um, and it was it was so inspiring. I was taking lots of notes, and um, there was actually a point at my desk where if you walk by my office, the general manager was in tears that day. And it was the story that one of the women told about um, the Whisper Network which was kind of an unofficial circle of people who, uh, women who would um, warn other women about predators in the newsrooms. And that was the moment um, for me where I stopped and I thought, how many predators have, have we worked with or known that other people worked with? And, and her point was, you know, at first this Whisper Network felt like a support group, and then eventually it occurred to her that in essence, by not reporting it or, or having reported it and it not have been dealt with, it was like they were serving up generation after generation of journalists um, and young women to these predators. Um, and I got to thinking how many women I had worked with, and not just women, but people, you know, promising young journalists I had worked with through the years who quit. And they got out of the business because of how they were treated. Um, and as a young journalist coming up, um, we noticed it, but I'm not, I, I felt powerless. I wasn't sure what to do either. Um, and so I think that was the moment where I thought, you know, even, even if I was not the person who was able to make a change in the past, I want to make sure that, especially for all the students in the back, that you don't have to put up the, with all the crap that we did um, coming up in our newsrooms. And what Sue has been doing since then, we'll get to in a moment, um, but also during that conversation, there was a, an alert that was sent up, and it was this. Conversations about Me Too can easily devolve into the interests of straight white women, and that we have to be very careful to make sure that intersectionality is absolutely at the heart of every conversation we have. We cannot separate out harassment from discrimination, and you have to recognize that incivility is often a gateway to both of those things. And newsroom cultures that support any of that are going to be problematic. If it isn't just a straight white women's issue, imagine being president of NLGJA and wanting to make sure that that, that voice is in the conversation as well. So Sharif, let's talk a little bit about the conversations that are going on and the work that you are doing to make certain that all voices are heard. Well, sure. I mean, you know, there's mention of Politico's um, no asshole policy. And you have to, everyone has been in a newsroom that doesn't follow that policy. And when you have assholes more celebrated than you're in your newsroom, what does that newsroom tend to look like? Well, often it tends to look like a newsroom where uh, a macho culture is celebrated that can often exclude LGBTQ people. Um, the people who are celebrated are not people who view the world differently than through that prism. Uh, it can be a world in which the norm, the thing that gets on the front page, the thing that's discussed in meetings, doesn't have to do with people of color or with LGBTQ people. And so, when we're going after these structures to try to change them and to change newsroom cultures, this actually is an opportunity to have discussions about some of the other intersectionality that is not being represented in the product that we produce and in the newsroom culture that we actually know from a business standpoint and from just a doing the right thing standpoint, we need to develop. So NLGA uh, has been doing work for a number of years and, and NLGA is a product of the same culture. Um, it is a place where, uh, for a while, a, a lot of um, white guys dominated. Um, despite the fact that it was founded by Roy Aarons, who always um, 
belief in encouraging the diversity of uh, our newsrooms. Well, um, we've been getting better and better at, at doing that. And so the resources that we have, including our style book, which addresses a lot of um, these issues, which has been influential in um, changing the AP style book and the New York Times style book, um, has helped to get at the language that we need to convey to our audiences. Uh, our organization also just does one sheets whenever there's a, a big story like a Supreme Court case coming up, like um, President Trump changing the policy in terms of transgender people in the military. Uh, we try to get that information in front of people so they don't have to dig through the style book, so they know uh, the terminology to use so that our audiences get the right respectful messages uh, about folks in the transgender community. Um, and we also kind of talk about all the issues that we've been talking about today at our annual conferences. And there are opportunities not just for people who are, are steeped in these issues, but people who want the one-on-one, -on -one, who want the basics. Uh, what we want to do is help those newsrooms that haven't had um, budgets for training, that haven't had, frankly, uh, the time for people to look up and see, gee, what do I do um, if the press release comes out from the police department? and it dead names someone and uses the names that are under legal documents rather than the names that they put. Uh, so our organization is has tools for those on our website in lgja.org, and we're also developing trainings to bring to newsrooms uh, in order to uh, help better this. Uh, a colleague of mine, um, Jen Christensen, who was president of the organization before I was, who is uh, chair of our upcoming um, uh, conference in, in New Orleans um, in, in September, everyone should come to the camp, um, went around to some of the biggest name newsrooms um, in the country, newsroom where you think, hey, they must get it right, right? And what she noticed, the pattern was, she would go into the room and, and talk particularly about um, transgender issues. And, and, and the person who had the beat of covering the LGBT community was nodding along and knew everything that was going on. And the other 60 people in the room had no idea. They were depending on this one person to get it right, to get it right, to bring up the right stories, to see the nuance of these stories. And so we know that there's work to do in the largest newsrooms in the country. And if that's the case, then we know that there's work to do in the regional newsrooms. Uh, and we are here to help. So when you said the word macho culture, that deals directly with the research that Lindsay has done and, and to the work that we'll reference that IWMF is addressing as well. Lindsay, you share? So I think it's really interesting to hear everyone talk about this. And when we're, I, I love that you use that, the terminology macho culture. Um, because I think that such a big part of the problem is in the culture, it is in, especially if we're thinking specifically about news organizations working in the United States and news networks working here, um, and the way in which they'll sort of train both male and female identified journalists to perform this certain kind of being a journalist, which does end up taking on a, a very specifically macho tone. And then exporting that into you know different international contexts. I study international journalism, the ways in which white, specifically white Anglo macho culture is kind of taken um, to different places around the world and even kind of, you know, used as a training tool in some ways for journalists who are being trained in different international contexts but who also are not really seen as being as worth um, worthy of protection or the same amount of money or anything like that as, as their sort of Anglo um, and white Western colleagues. So it's really exciting to me to be able to speak a little bit about um, the International Women's Media Foundation who just recently um, received this $1 million grant, which many of you have already probably heard a little bit about even before today's panel, um, a $1 million grant from CBS Corporation, kind of in the wake of some of the, the Me Too issues at CBS. Less moon vest reparations. Less moon vest yeah. reparations. <laughs> so something really good coming out of something very negative. Um, and they're using this money, which I think is so exciting, not only to sort of you know pursue issues of online harassment, digital safety, um, professional development and leadership, but also physical safety training specifically geared toward women or female identified journalists and the, the very unique dangers that they might specifically face in the process of doing their work. 
which I know to be an important thing because really it wasn't even until around 2011 that the Committee to Protect Journalists was looking very systematically at issues of sexual assault in the field. And 2011 was, if you'll remember, when Laura Logan, the CBS reporter, was assaulted in Egypt um, and then sort of, you know, had this very um, public discussion about that and decided to really put a name, you know, to this problem that, that she said, you know, had been kind of kept silent for so long. So for this organization now, the International Women's Media Foundation, to be specifically focusing on how to, to, to prepare um, female identified journalists to protect themselves in those very unique specific ways, I think is really important. I would love to see even more work like this um, geared toward thinking about you know, LGBTQ journalists thinking about, you know, the unique challenges um, that intersectionality brings to the table. Because it, again, like one of the great things about the International Women's Media Foundation is it does, they think intersectionally. It's not just about white women. It's not about cis women necessarily, right? And it's not just about straight women. All of these issues, all of these different ways of identifying matter when we're talking about protecting journalists. So I think that's something really exciting. And Professor Ferrier, uh, IWMF supports your troll busters as well, right? Yeah. And in the most recent summit, which we held in January, uh, the one where you saw me asking people, raise your hand if you change your conversations. It was in the video. A lot of conversations have changed in newsrooms. Eliza Munoz, the uh, executive director of IWMF, sort of stopped the show when she talked about that research and said uh, one of the things that they've heard anecdotally from women in their hostile environment training for overseas uh, deployments in conflict zones is that they, uh, some of them pack morning after pills with them, anticipating that they may be assaulted. That gives you pause. Now, Let's go back to solutions, because that's not the solution we want, okay? Um, before we talk about um, a, a big project that we're doing, um, I'd like to talk about an interesting solution that is happening at conferences. Uh, one of the things we recognized, uh, and if you look at the, again, at, at the uh, EEOC's task force report, they talk about risk factors for harassment and sexual misconduct. And among them are disproportionate levels of power, um, relative youth of, of individuals in an organization, making them more vulnerable, uh, people who work remotely, people who rely on the good will of customers in order to make their living. So any of you who've been uh, in food service work, wait staff, bartending, you recognize the amount of endurance level you may sometimes have and at which point you decide the tip isn't worth it, right? Um, when, uh, when, the, when the, ta the EEOC task force wanted to look at solutions uh, in 20, uh, 2018, uh, they held another hearing um, at which our work that we're doing uh, at the Partnership Project uh, was uh, in, entered into testimony. But I sat beside a woman from Oakland, California, who owns a chain of mac and cheese restaurants, who always thought that she had a very female-friendly culture uh, thought she was treating her employees well and was shocked to find out that she um, that, that people were being harassed and didn't want to tell their managers. Um, the kinds of things that were being said to them by customers, they didn't want to repeat, especially if it was a woman talking to a male manager. Uh, they, might lose, they might lose their income, their, their tip, if they um, lost the table. And so she developed a system to change it. And the system is quite elegant in its application. And when she described it, it sounded so good that I'm going to let Tracy pick up the story from there because she has adopted it at Political. Yeah, so what I love about this story is I, I think sometimes when we talk about sexual harassment, one of the things that is difficult is to talk about sexual harassment. Some of the words we need to use, the things we need to describe, people have a spectrum of comfort level in using certain words and certain phrases. Um, and what I love about the system that the mac and cheese restaurants developed was it's a red, orange, yellow system. 
Uh, so uh, something that's a yellow might be um, a first offense. It might be just an inappropriate comment. Kind of creepy vibe, right? Exactly. So yeah, that's that's where your, your creepers come in. Uh, the orange might be something that has been repeated a few times. So additional comments. It might be an escalation to a touch. It might be an escalation to uh, a request or, or a question that is completely inappropriate. Uh, and a red is, is something that is just an extreme. So again, it, it might be a, a grab of a behind or, or something along those lines. What I love about this system is the owner put the determination in the hands of her wait staff. So it wasn't her or the manager on duty's decision to decide whether something is a yellow, an orange, or a red. It was each individual member of the staff. So what, what's wonderful about that is, again, what I may find offensive might be a little different than Susan's, but it doesn't matter because if it's happening to me, I get to decide. And so if it's a, a yellow, it gets flagged. If it was an orange, in the case of the restaurant, the store manager would, would take over the table. And if it was a red, the store manager would ask the customer to leave. Um, and I just thought that that was so simple and so wonderful. Politico has a live events business. And so we often have the uh, additional uh, complication of there's often alcohol and, and, and they're later in the evening events. And many of the folks that work at those events, these are their first careers, so they're young. Um, and what would often happen is, is the good news they would, they knew, they would come after an event and say, oh my goodness, Tracy, I had this thing happen. I hope I dealt with it okay in the moment. I told my manager, the manager would come back to me the next day and say, I dealt with it, but what else do I need to do now? Um, and so the good news was, is I was getting the information, but what I was always wanting was something to help them in the moment. So when I heard, as, as part of the Power Shift Summit, about this particular system, I was like, you know what, let's give it a try. Um, and so I talked to the manager of the group, and she's like, I love it. Um, and so a member of my staff who partners with that manager worked with the manager, and they just did um, an entire training around that. And basically, we built our timeline. This weekend is the White House Correspondents um, Dinner, and many events will occur over this weekend that our staff will be involved in. So what we wanted to do is make sure as going into this weekend, they all had this system and the, the language in case they encountered someone who had had a little too much to drink or someone who got a little handsy, although I know what Jill likes it when we say molesty rather than handsy because handsy sounds too cutesy. Um, but when somebody gets inappropriate, we're hoping this weekend that they will have the power um, to be able to deal with something using that same uh, yellow or red. And by the way, if the manager takes over the table at the restaurant, the tips still go to the wait staff. That's important. Um, so finding solutions is really important. And some of the other risk factors uh, that have been noted in the research are alcohol, a star system at work. Uh, Any time that um, there is an outgroup, if you are the person who is unlike the other, all of those risks rise. And because we knew that traditional training had not been effective, and you know how journalists are about most imposed training anyway, um, that we, we thought we ought to do more than just convene. And so um, after the first power shift in 2018, uh, the Freedom Forum decided, first of all, they, they offered, I, I had been volunteering, and they said, could we sign you on to help us develop some curriculum, since I teach uh, in the newsrooms all the time. What kind of curriculum could we develop that we could use to help address the culture of newsrooms? And so that led to um, a curriculum that I created and was rolled out in June of last year. And could you show that tape now so that we can get a sense of what we're talking about? The Workplace Integrity Curriculum is custom designed for media organizations, not just for journalists, but for all media employees who want their workplaces to be environments free of harassment, discrimination, and incivility, but filled with opportunity, especially for those who've traditionally been denied it. That's workplace integrity. The three-part course is interactive and lively. 
It respects the experience and expertise of the participants, whether seasoned veterans or student interns. It's built on three pillars, critical thinking, courageous conversations, and culture of respect and trust. During all three modules, staffers work in teams. They talk together, think out loud, and find the comfort to have the kind of conversations we just don't usually have at work. Each module has its own exercises, analyzing things we've heard or said at work for their accuracy, assumptions, bias, logic, and alternatives. Speaking up in challenging workplace situations, proactively and reactively, using practical case studies to role play and practice. Building a workplace culture of respect and trust by showing what it takes, the value, skills, tools, systems, and assumptions, and showing what each one looks like in everyday behaviors and choices. After each module, participants download their takeaways both for themselves and for their organization. They set personal goals, things they'll work on, who their allies will be, and how they'll measure success. And in the culture exercise, they use a matrix that spreads and shares responsibility for respect and trust across individuals, teams, and the company. With this foundation of their own ideas and solutions, they build workplace integrity. Environments free of harassment, discrimination, and incivility, but filled with opportunity, especially for those who've traditionally been denied it. The faces you've seen belong to the inaugural class of workplace integrity trainers, all of whom experience the training as they learn to deliver it back home. And because the workplace integrity curriculum was selected to receive a major grant from CBS, qualified organizations now send staff free of charge with subsidized travel to the power shifts train the trainer workshops for workplace integrity. Before you leave, I'll tell you about the upcoming trainings, and if you qualify, we'd love to have you join us to become a trainer in your own organization. But in that first class picture was Katie Culver, <laughs> one of the first uh, certified trainers, and Tracy Schweikert, and Sue <laughs> was there. And Sue, and, and, it, and not, it not only was Sue there, but you brought along the head of HR for Great Televisions, your entire station's group. Oh look, we got it up here already. Just clean it up, right? And just know that if you um, if you are interested and you have the ability to train your organization, whether it's a university or whether it's a media workplace, um, then you could qualify for participation in these. You can get all the information at um, just just Google uh, train the trainer power shift and you'll find it online. But let's go to Sue, who has actually now been trained in the company of your HR director, and tell us why that was important. Yeah. You know, I think um, initially, so I had some exposure to uh, the program through Jill, and um, initially my thought was, as a general manager, I'm passionate about this, but I'm just one station in a much larger group. So I reached out to um, our vice president of HR, Jane Goldstein, um, I ran it by her, and she said, that that's amazing. So I um, reached back out to Jill, and Farm Institute, and so they so graciously uh, included Jan in the invitation. I was really pleased that she could join us. Again, we keep talking about systemic change. The stories we heard were about individuals, but this is not just a problem of individual misbehavior. It's about sy systems and customs and normative behavior that allow it to happen. And so, unless we deal with that, we're not. We're going to keep having episodes, right? So um, the curriculum, as you've seen described, basically um, engages people in having some conversations and allows them to come up with the answers. And it's a, it's a trick in teaching, which some of us have, have taken a long time to learn, which is where do you want people to get to in the training? And, and how can you get there without lecturing to them? And so imagine journalists who love to pick things apart, who love to critique things. Instead of telling them um, where logical flaws in your language can lead to misunderstandings, hand them 16 statements and have them pull them apart. Statements that include um, sentences like, well, why didn't they report it earlier? Or if they don't want to get hit on, why did they come to work dressed like they're going to a party? Or it's only just a first offense. 
or it's he said, she said, there's nothing we can do. Or we can't control what people do outside of work. Or they're both adults, it's not our business. Or HR protects the company and not you. Or this person doesn't seem like a good fit for us. Or a statement like, well, that, they can't take a joke. Who wants that kind of holier than thou vibe on the team? And these are not the pernicious statements that are outwardly, you know, vicious and antagonistic. But within each of them can be embedded some flaws of accuracy or logic, or there could be inherent bias. And so uh, the journalists themselves, and they don't have to be journalists, the people in the organizations, um, are the ones who take those sentences apart. Sue has done this training. Can you tell us how it's going? Going very well, actually. Um, the first time I did it was uh, in August, so just a couple months after attending the training. Um, and we did it with a bunch of gray stations regionally. Um, I noticed Jess Lachesby, our news director at WMTV here in Madison, um, joined us for this. Um, she was one of uh, the first to go through the program along with her general manager. We had um, representatives there from our station in Rockford and Cedar Rapids and Colorado Springs um, and Madison. And um, you know these were managers and supervisors, so in, in, in a lot of ways it was like preaching to the choir, right? Um, these were people who wanted to do the right thing. And, um, but even I think all of us were surprised, you know, most of us had heard all these statements, maybe some of us had said them in the past. Um, and we all knew that it wasn't right, and in our hearts, and our minds, we, we knew that there should be a better response but to work together on those as a group and actually determine what that response was like, boy, that doesn't feel right to me, but how do I articulate it? How do I have that conversation? Um, it, was, it was great because it allowed um, people from different stations, and by the way, these weren't just journalists. These were sales managers, they were chief engineers, they were operations managers and local and general sales managers. So these were folks from um, all different departments at our television stations. Um, and so they were able to take a lot of the uh, beautiful case studies that were put together and also just, just rethink some of them. How would that, for example, um, what if it was an account executive who was out seeing the client who was inappropriate? As a general manager, should I be concerned about that? Absolutely, because my job is to protect our employees and our station's reputation. Um, so, so that one was, I think, groundbreaking for us and for our stations. Um, it went so well that, um, you know, I think as a as managers, it's our responsibility to make sure that we're not just doing things at the top. If what we're doing at the top doesn't get all the way down to the employee level, then we're failing. Um, so we made the decision to do some power shift summits with um, our entire staff. And so over the last couple of months, um, we, we had to we shorten it a little bit. Um, but we went through the critical thinking and the uh, courageous conversation sections with every member of my staff. And um, it, was, it was very eye-opening. It was inspiring. There were a lot of like the quiet people who work in the control room that you don't hear from very often, who had a lot of great things to say and a lot of great questions. Um, and um, I've seen just overall in the building, I've seen a change with how they interact with the teamwork. Um, knock on wood, um, we are, I also have a no assholes policy uh, in the building. And, um, you know, we are, we have, if we have differences, we talk them through professionally. We have a lot of differences. Every, every organization does, I think. Um, but the level of civility in our building has, Definitely increased. So you told me a story about some of your staff members watching a live stream of a conference and starting to pick apart, pick it apart, and having taken the critical thinking exercise. They, they did. Um, so I, I, I won't share where, but um, there was a, something similar to this um, that was going on, and so a few of our staff members said, "Hey, that's you know that that's really interesting. We're going to watch um, that live stream." And then as soon as I got back from a different conference I was at, um, they they came to me right away and they, they had to point out, so there was someone there and he kept saying, well, you know, women just really need to report this sooner. And so, of course, my staff, having been through this, are going, well, why didn't they report it sooner? Maybe they were worried about retaliation. Maybe they were embarrassed. They went through all the, the pieces from the critical thinking exercise. So I was very proud of them. Um, and it's also just a reminder of how important it is to 
have these conversations into challenge statements like Joel just shared with us? Um, we've developed case studies uh, with, in cooperation with Katie Calder. We are now adding, we're doing a 2.0 release of the curriculum so that it is even more useful in university settings. I've been using it in guest lecturing at Loyola and also teaching it at conferences coming up this year, um, which including IRE, EIJ, ASNE, Primd, I'm forgetting them now, but I'm telling you this because it speaks to the fact that when the word gets out, that there is something that is not sort of shame-based, because there are people of goodwill who just want to figure out how to do the right thing or find the right words, um, that, that they'll want it, and all of these journalism conferences have asked for its um, involvement. Um, but one of the things that we think is very important, um, and we have a, a very helpful advisory board um, to the project, which consists of representatives of many of the minority journalism organizations. And in March, we brought the heads of all of the minority journalism organizations, plus the Center for Journalism and Disability um, at ASU, and um, oh, Women's Media Center, uh, IWMF, JAWS, the Journalism and Women's Symposium. Um, NLGJA is already on our board. But the importance of making sure this is ubiquitous. The cases when we use uh, the, session, the section of it that does case studies is intentionally written um, in second person. It's about you. You are in this cir circumstance. And what we always teach in it is, who are you compared to the, the you sitting next to you? How would it be different if it were, if you were Sharif, if you were Lindsay? Would it make a difference? And can we talk a little bit about the importance of that um, ubiquity, <laughs> Sharif, and um, I think the importance of making sure we've got diverse voices whenever we have these kinds of trainings? Oh, sure. Oh, he's uh, got yeah. trained too, he's a trainer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the challenge can be when people see them as them, and they happen to be the leaders in the movement faces that you see in the newsroom, they might not take into consideration how they would handle the situation. If it happened to be um, a, a, a man who is in power and a man who is the person who is being, this thing's being perpetrated on, or, or in a lot of newsrooms, frankly, um, the entire newsroom is of one race. And so it could be a challenge in terms of looking at that difference um, if they dealt with um, someone who's of a different race. And, and I know that a lot of us like to think, oh, we handled it exactly the same. But um, as we brought the discussions, uh, would you handle it the same? Would you be more likely to gossip about it? Would you be more likely to see it as differently than the situation that you're in, whether you articulate it that way or not? And so it, it's important to have these scenarios be um, universal. And what I think is also great about the training and, and think it is something that is being improved in the training is that by asking the questions the way that they're being asked, it leaves room for people who don't speak up normally to be able to speak, for people to, the silence in the room sometimes, gives space for someone who is a racial minority or, or who's a woman in the world who is LGBTQ to also put in their perspective on the scenario. And so that can get groups thinking and newsrooms thinking about how they are dealing with those voices that they might not hear all the time. Well, Lindsay, when you've written about your own research, you said, solutions are slow in coming, sometimes just the awareness of conversations makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's so wonderful to hear about this training that you're, you know, that you all have engaged in today because I think that there there is this sense, at least among a lot of the people who I've interviewed for my research who are mostly news editors um, and journalists who work again internationally, but the sense that that to make an entire news culture really change is probably going to take several generations. And so there's this way of kind of saying, so we'll hand that off to the next generation, we'll start the process of being a little bit more aware, but the real concrete things, the real changes, probably are going to happen at some other time somewhere else. Um, and I think that that's something that has been changing a lot. That's just been the, like, that's sort of the, the traditional sense of things. And, you know, um, training like this can actually really help this sort of thing move forward in the minds of the people who need that change in the culture surrounding them. 
Um, so I, I think that raising awareness in ways that are systematic, um, certainly sharing the richness of individual stories, but, but always connecting that again to those deeper um, structural constraints. Also raising awareness proactively rather than reactively. This is something that sort of came up, I think, in the video that you just showed us. How do we how do we do this even when there hasn't been a big scandal today, right? How, do, how are we always kind of doing this type of work? Um, and then again, you know, raising awareness in a way that is always thinking intersectionally and never leaving that out because it, it's never something that should be left out. <laughs> it is the very heart of the entire question. Uh, Jill, can I mention um, in uh, that conversation that you mentioned where minority journalism organizations were involved, uh, a lot of the feedback was um, this, is, this training is great for people who lead from wherever they are. Uh, whoever is seen as a voice in the newsroom who could lead this kind of conversation, but that there needs to be a focus on people who are lead, who are have a titular lead leadership position in the organization in order to change culture. And I know that that is already thought of to some degree in the training, but that you're also looking at making some changes to focus on that. Thank you for reminding me. Um, we heard that message loud and clear that we can do the work that we're doing at the mid level of organizations. And on July 15th at the museum, we're doing a session called uh, The Tone Starts at the Top. And we're bringing um, everyone from top level managers to CEOs in. And, you know, when, when Les Moonves gives up a lot of his money because he did the wrong things and CBS gives you a half a million dollars, you can underwrite a few of these things. And fortunately, you know, uh, those ill gotten gains are helping us underwrite these programs. And um, we will be doing um, a, the, the EEOC briefing. Um, and again, um, this actually, by a twist of fate, uh, a former commissioner of the EEOC named Hai Feldblum was not renewed this year because her renewal reappointment was held up by one vote. Uh, Senator Mike Lee, who disapproved of her as a gay woman supporting gay marriage in an essay. So she was not um, re, um, re up, but she and her deputy, who is a member of our advisory board, uh, are now in private practice specializing in sharing the information from all the research that they've done. And they are going to be doing a briefing, and it's like solid gold. We're going to be putting the executives through the exercises that people go through in the training. We're going to be sharing best practices and picking on a few of these folks again to tell the stories. And we're also going to roll out a new piece, a teaching piece, um, about how to qualify to be an ally. And I use that term intentionally. I don't think any, you cannot claim to be an ally. Just because you can't claim to be a leader. You can aspire to be either. But only the people who are with you and invest their trust in you based on your behaviors will decide if you're an ally. And one of the reasons that um, we felt um, so grateful to have been able to have a listening session with the heads of all of the minority journalism organizations was that we would ask them what we should put in this curriculum. If we have the benefit of the resources to do it, we want to make certain that we have the wisdom of all of the people who have been working in these areas for so long to help inform them. Because what we realized is you cannot separate harassment from discrimination, but the expertise in discrimination has long, long been the work of many other organizations. And so we want to make certain that we're absolutely respectful of them and that they inform all of our teaching. So with that, we will be working with executives in July. Um, any of you who are um, eligible to teach in your organization, whether it's academic or whether it's media, um, just check this out because you could get a trip to any one of those places in two days with us. <laughs> We're pushing up against a deadline. And so if there are any questions, I'd at least take two if there are any in the room. Doctor. First and foremost, um, I do want to note, and to an earlier comment from a woman in the back, that many of the people in the room were doing a heavy lifting of doing this training and bringing back to the organization. Besides Ms. Al Stewart, who was there, who I want to call out, who was in the room? We invited people. Exactly. We invited people. <laughs> so, um, again, how can we move beyond? women, people of color, carrying this message into the newsrooms, et cetera, to do this kind of work. That was more of a comment than anything. Yep. One of the other things that I just saw recently this week was a study that came out that HR, journalism uh, ads, 
are now putting personality type language into them, saying they're looking for people with a certain kind of personality, likability, et cetera. Code words for you either look like us or you behave you're like us or don't rock the boat because we're not gonna hire you. And so how can we, from the very beginnings, make sure that we're getting people in the door um, that can shake up the system rather than become part of the crowd? Um, and that's such a point well taken because even as we have the definition of workplace integrity saying free of harassment, discrimination, and incivility, um, we are aware that in some, in, in historically, civility can be used to oppress people. You know, you're being uncivil if you say something I don't agree with. And our feeling is um, knowing that the research says that incivility meaning um, brutal bullying language toward other people can be a gateway toward other uh, bad behavior. We're just going to own that description in the training that we do to make sure it's very specifically circumscribed. Well, can I add uh, to address the question about how do we how do we make sure that women and minorities aren't aren't carrying all the burden of this? Um, I've had a colleague ask me when they see the photos of our training sessions, how'd you get all the men to come? <laughs> And my response is, why wouldn't they come? I mean, this was, you know, for us, a group of managers. And when part of the exercise is we identify what are your values and goals in the workplace? And why would those lead you to want to speak up about um, harassment and discrimination? And when we list the values and goals for the workplace, those didn't differ between men and women. They wanted um, the opportunity to succeed. They wanted um, a workplace where it, it felt inclusive, that it wasn't clicky, that um, there was good teamwork, that they felt emotionally and physically safe. Um, and, and to your point, we were intentional in, in the original and the second power shift to uh, invite women's voices. We did not exclude men, but there was a preponderance of women. And it was similar in the beginning of the training. Many of the people who were at that training were also at the first summit. They already had exhibited a real passion. Um, but we wanted to make certain that, um, that you know, righteous men could be in, it just as involved and welcome. And the reason I think this is what you brought up is so important is that one of the things that we're going to be talking about in allyship, and, and it, it comes up in so many of the emerging leaders programs that I work with, is that there are a lot of well-intentioned leaders and organizations who will ask, say, Michelle, will you just be on our diversity committee? And then would you be on this committee and help diversify it? And then, by the way, um, would you just mentor this younger person? And all of those things sound like I walk away going, she should be probably pretty happy that I'm, I'm woke. <laughs> you know, I got her on all these things, except that that becomes invisible work. She's not getting credit for it. She's being asked to do a whole bunch of things and carry a whole bunch of burdens that I don't even see. Because I don't even see the other people who come informally for coaching to her, who, who aren't going to get an ear, who can't get a story accepted for some reason by their boss. Um, and then when she goes home and hears from her family about why isn't that coverage right, and all the stuff that people are carrying because they want it to be right, but they're not getting credit for it. So I often say, if I tell you don't do invisible work, it means you have the right to turn it down. But more importantly, if you accept it as a, as a real belief that you're going to make things better, then don't let it be invisible. Then, do, then make certain with that, your, that your own leaders know. Because this should not be just the work of people who have suffered the worst um, of, the, of the bad behavior. Ageism, we're being intersectional here, and ageism affects women differently than men. Uh, the menopause jokes, are you integrating that into your curriculum? Thank you so much. Well, what, a, what an interesting thought. <laughs> um, I, I didn't do a case study on menopause jokes, but I can get that into there somehow, I bet. All right, very quickly. And then, Katie, I think you've got a big finish coming, so why don't you come up? So um, thank you for doing this. Um, it's so needed, and I hope it spreads to other industries. It's so important. Um, but change comes from repeated exposure. And so looking at your curriculum and looking at people that have implemented it, do you have kind of plans embedded to follow up with your staff and make sure these principles are holding, kind of reaffirming them um, at times beyond just the individual trainings? You know, what is so interesting is that we've been asked that the National Women's Law Center said, hey, can you do pre and post tests in the organizations to see how things are going? And, and it's, a, it's aspirational. You absolutely want that for any kind of activity that you're doing to show impact. 
Um, our challenge is that most organizations resist external surveys, and it was one of the things that came up in the um, in the uh, summit too this year. Is that there are several um, organizations that are trying right now to do assessments of you know culture, how people feel. Um, ASNE's own diversity survey, which they try to do each year, has um, has had just a horrific time getting response. So um, our goal of having pre and post testing remains. It's just a real aspiration. Following up, um, Trey, you do a lot of survey work. In yeah, so we do, and, and it's important for all the reasons that you mentioned, right? I mean, I, again, I think once upon a time when we weren't doing all the things that we needed to do, we would say, hey, we're there. People know we're there. They'll come to us if they need us. Um, and so specifically within Politico, and I know that, that many other folks are doing the same, is we are making sure that we are out in the newsroom more often. So as I mentioned, we meet with every new employee. We are making sure that we are interacting with them several times a year. Um, we do an annual employee survey. We have, um, we also have an open comment. Um, it's like a Google Doc, basically, that folks at any point in time can a question or a comment or a concern that we're constantly going back and looking at. Um, we just recently, uh, with our annual performance review process, we just started a manager review process. So we use our values and our manager expectations and we put that in a form and any employee can rate their manager on how their manager's doing and we use that to help with manager development. So we are constantly looking for different ways that we can check in and not just waiting for someone to come to us, but proactively going out and saying, how's this going? Did this work? Did it not work? Um, when it comes to the DNI, sometimes we do an activity and it falls completely flat, right? And we're like, okay, try that, it didn't work. What are we gonna do now? Um, what was good about that, what was not good about that? So we are regularly going out there trying to look for more data so that we can make it better. And, and um, in, in closing, I want you to keep one other thing in mind, which I didn't say when I introduced Tracy. If you know the history of the organization at which she works, it was a startup. And it was largely a um, male-dominated, white male-dominated, macho startup culture. And you came in as part of an effort to um, now take what had become a professional organization with new leadership and change the culture. That is what intentionality looks like in practice. So change is possible. Um, it starts with each of us. It starts at the top. It, ch it starts with changing systems, and we're working on it. So thank you, everybody. being here. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors as well, or all of the board members, Lindsay, Krista. Let's give a big shout out to the student fellows in the back of the room. over the weekend and next week. Um, I hope that you will join us in that bridging function that I talked about earlier in the day. Uh, I once interviewed a um, cardiothoracic surgeon and he asked me what my research focus was and I said journalism ethics and he said, is that a thing? <laughs> and I said, yes, in fact, it is quite a vibrant thing um, because these kinds of discussions go on every single day in classrooms, in newsrooms, um, in coffee shops, where freelancers get together, they are vital conversations. But if I have one concern about, I don't know, but my biggest concern about journalism today is that we don't talk about that enough. We do treat some of these conversations as a, as a walled garden that we don't let others in on. And I really hope that the center can be part of changing that, of, of letting the public know how seriously we take these issues. You know, still from Lou Gehrig, um, I stand here today feeling like the luckiest woman in the world because we got to be together today to tackle really challenging story problems with optimism and enthusiasm. So when these uh, recordings from this session get posted online, I hope you'll share them. Um, I hope you will talk about what we talked about here. I hope that you'll send us a story idea that you think that we should follow up on. Um, because the work of journalism, as we saw with these Shadi finalists, and as we saw with so many of our panelists today, the work of journalism is really 
fantastic story to tell. I will never be an apologist for problems. The problems are out there. Uh, but good, good work is out there too. It's worth celebrating and it's worth talking about. It's worth sharing. So with that, I wish you all a wonderful weekend and I hope that you will join us next year when we will yet again wrestle with some thorny problems. So thank you very much.